Good evening. I'd like to thank you very much for coming this evening and, and to welcome you to the Archives and History Library. Uh, we're truly grateful for your continued attendance at our lectures and, and we have a number of, uh, of good ones coming up. Uh, certainly I want to thank Dick Faust. I don't know if I did this last time. But Dick, puts, uh, Dick, Dick videotapes all of our lectures and workshops. We had people inquiring early on about streaming video, this kind of thing, kind of, uh, and we thought that it would uh, be best if we have it online and it's available for folks to, to view any time that they want. So it's worked out very well, and thanks to Dick for that. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, tonight's lecture. I've been looking forward to it for quite a while because of, uh, you know, I know where Rock Springs Park is, and I've been there, and, and just, you know, oftentimes trying to imagine what it would have been like with those tens of thousands of people coming there on a daily basis. Uh, before I introduce our, our speaker this evening, I do want to note some of the upcoming lectures, just a couple of them. Uh, on Thursday, in fact, next Thursday, July 11th, Gregory Clendenin will be speaking about uh, the Clendenin family and the Clendenin massacre. So that will be next Thursday. On August 6th, Jerry Sutton will be here to talk about the Great Kanawha River and river transportation in West Virginia. So we'll certainly look forward to that. And we do have in, uh, in attendance another distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Bob Barnett, will be speaking on September the 10th. Uh, and his lecture title is Hillside Fields, A History of Sports in West Virginia. I believe he just uh, has a publication on that very topic. So uh, looking forward to that as well. Um, our speaker this evening is Joseph A. Kong, who will discuss the history of the now defunct Rock Springs Amusement Park that operated, and I must say that I, I've called it Rock Spring on occasion. Uh, I saw on his blog where our marker says Rock Spring, our advertisement said Rock Spring, so I feel guilty about all of that, but he's here to set us straight this evening. Uh, but he's going to talk about Rock Springs Amusement Park, which operated from 1897 until 1970 up in Chester in Hancock County. This is something many of us didn't know about. Uh, Mr. Com grew up in Chester and he is the author of Rock Springs Park, which is part of the uh, Arcadia Image of America series, Images of America series. And he has some of those books that he would be glad to sell you and sign for you, I'm sure. Uh, he studied theater arts and education at the University of Pittsburgh and graduated with BA and MAT degrees. He is an elementary gifted support teacher with an interest in local history and currently is working on a book on legendary locals of Latrobe, Pennsylvania, where he teaches. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Mr. Joe Kahn. Thank you, welcome everyone. Now, before I begin tonight, I'd just like to thank Joe Geiger Brian Ward, Randy Markham, Robert Taylor, and the folks here at West Virginia Archives for allowing me to come and speak to you tonight. And thank you all for coming as well. And it's a holiday week, it's warm out there, but I appreciate seeing you all here, and I hope we'll have a little bit of fun here today. I feel especially honored to speak tonight, uh, in this year, the state's sesquicentennial, especially since we just passed the birthday on June 20th, so 150 years. Growing up, I shared a room with my older brother, Andy, and we had twin beds in the bedroom. And on the headboard of the beds, we had placed the cows and stickers, the NFL logo, the American flag, and one of the stickers on my bed was the state seal of West Virginia. So uh, I was sent to bed early quite a bit in my younger days, so it was oftentimes still light out, but if it got dark, I had a flashlight in there. And, um, I remember staring at that sticker and I was kind of fascinated by it because of the date, 1863. See, I was born in 1963, so that 100 years I just sort of felt a special connection to it. But I can remember one night, this is the way my imagination worked as a child, I whispered over to my brother, hey Andy, I made up names for the two guys on the West Virginia sticker. I said, the guy with the ax is Larry and the guy with the pick is Mo. And he was like, the Stooges? That's dumb. Where's Curly? I was like, well, he's the big boulder in the middle. <laughs> so you can see how my imagination worked as a kid. That will come into play here in a little bit, I believe. 
Um, it's actually been over a year since I did a book talk. Um, the book was released in 2010, and I had a very nice homecoming back in Chester, sponsored by the Kiwanis Club. They invited me back. I spoke at uh, what was the old high school, and it was a very nice reception there. And uh, I even have a small contingency here from uh, the northern panhandle of Hancock County. So I have uh, some family and friends here, so I appreciate all of you for coming as well. The last time I presented was to a women's group in East Liverpool, Ohio, which is just across the Ohio River from Chester. And uh, at the end of the talk, uh, as I was signing some books, one of the ladies confessed to me. She was saying, uh, uh, you know what, when they told us the author of Rock Springs Park was coming, I thought you were going to be kind of a little old balding man with gray hair. And that's what you expected. And you know, I said, well, you know, I'm working on that. So it won't be long. So I'd like to start off tonight talking about uh, the different parks in West Virginia. And if you will indulge me, talk a little bit about my childhood and our generation's connection to the park at that time. Um, now, the, the book uh, traces the history of the park. So I'll be uh, showing you some slides here in a few minutes which will actually trace the history of the park from the Native Americans visiting the grove at Rock Springs uh, all the way through the demise of the park. So in rehearsal, my talk takes about an hour, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, there might be a few laughs in between, so we might stretch that out a little bit. But at the end, if you would like to ask any questions, make a mental note, or if you, you know, feel comfortable calling out, I'd be happy to try to answer your questions at the end or as we go along. Now the story of Rock Springs Park is the story told of many communities across the United States. A local trolley park was created at the turn of the last century as a profit-making venture for a big transit company. It then became a weekend destination for hard-working men and women and their families, sponsored school picnics, offered bathing, boating, dancing, and amusements until peaking in attendance in the late 1920s. Then began a gradual decline due to the Great Depression, the automobile, and the returning war veterans who had seen the world and did not want to sit at home or visit the fading amusement park in their backyard. Now there are currently only two amusement parks in West Virginia. There's Camden Park, and uh, some people were telling me about Camden Park. I haven't had the privilege to visit it yet. Uh, and nearby Huntington, and there is a park called Valley Worlds of Fun in Fairmont, which is relatively newer and uh, quite a bit smaller. But a hundred years ago, there were nine amusement parks in the state, including Rock Springs at the tip of the northern panhandle and Camden at the bend in Huntington. Now, most of these parks, just like Rock Springs, were originally wood groves that were first, uh, which first attracted Native Americans. And in the case of Camden Park, as you probably know better than I, uh, the Adena people built a conical burial mound there where Rock Springs Park was more of a hunting ground, sacred hunting ground. Now as the white settlers moved west, these sacred sites became picnic groves uh, for school functions and church outings. Soon they were erecting pavilions for dining and dancing and even prize fights. Then with the introduction of electricity, trolley companies began to purchase these sites and uh, would uh, end their lines there in order to attract riders on the weekends. Now, most of the parks operating at the turn of the last century were trolley parks, such as Rock Springs Park. Now, if you were to visit the site of Rock Springs Park today, there is very little evidence of its, of its existence. It was completely erased in 1974 to make way for an on-ramp to Cloverleaf Exchange for the then new Jennings Randolph Bridge. So the park would have been as the highway curves through the mountain pass there. That was actually the lower part, which was the picnic park. And then to your right, uh, sort of off the screen, would have been the upper park, which would have had most of the amusements. Now in Chester, you could still visit. Oh, excuse me. In Chester, you could still visit this home, which was a uh, one-time park owner C. A. Smith's house, and um, this is how it looks today. And it's actually located, yeah, right above the world's largest teapot. And um, we were just talking about the fact that they are remodeling the house. It's going to be an inn. Um, so it was, had fallen into disrepair, but we're glad to see that it's being rescued and will be used as an inn. Now another structure that's still there is this log home, which was once the family home of Bob and Virginia Hand, the last owners of the park. And it's very 
rare, at least from my research, to find an amusement park where the owners and operators actually lived on the park grounds. Now this, this home is not where it originally sat. It was moved 100 yards out of the path of progress by train and truck and placed on a new foundation. And you can see the almost heaven sign in the front yard. This greets passengers coming across the Jennings Randolph Bridge. It's one of the first sights that they, that they see. Now this is the famous spring right before the park was raised. And the spring is still there. Uh, a friend from back home took me there when I was doing research for the park. But today it sort of drains unceremoniously into a drainage ditch. It's actually just a short walking distance from where the teapot is today. But they did extend uh, the spring at the time that the highway was put in. And people did still go there and fill up water jugs and things. But apparently the pipe has been bent by some of the uh, people cutting the grass, perhaps. The historic marker was placed there in 1980. It's a little closer view. And um, you know, we mentioned this, this rock spring without the final S. And, uh, but I was hoping to draw your attention to the last line here. Now this, the sign talks about the history of the park, but it, as far as its demise, it says that the automobile and changing social customs led to the disuse and sale of the park by 1970. And um, thinking about some of the things that drew people away from the park, uh, for my generation, it might have been something as simple as television. I was a big fan of TV. I wouldn't say I was a TV junkie, but I, I liked the shows, especially the shows with superheroes in them. So there's a picture of me, probably six or seven, in my costume. And you might think, well, it's Halloween. Possibly not. I wore <laughs> costumes all year round. Here's me as Batman in the backyard. It's obviously summertime here. The laundry is up. Um, but uh, even when I go back home today, I'll be standing at the 4th of July parade. And someone will say, Joe Calm, I remember you. We used to take bets on who you'd be for the day. <laughs> so I don't remember Batman having a Stanley claw hammer in his utility belt. But uh, So I thought that was kind of cool until a friend found me on Facebook and sent me this picture that her father took. So there I am in the neighbor's yard, just standing there, and this one. So, not really that cool. It's kind of creepy, actually, to have a miniature Batman skulking around your yard with a pretzel stick in his mouth or whatever. Now, the other thing that drew my generation away from the park was the local mall. So here you can see me in 1970 visiting Beaver Valley Mall with my cousin. That's me on the left with the striped pants. And that is uh, 60's Batman's Burt Ward. He was at the mall signing autographs. And I can remember my aunt telling me, and we were so surprised because there wasn't anybody there. You, you guys just walked up and he talked to you and signed your picture and everything. So uh, it was things like this that kind of drew us away from the park. Now, other parks like Kennywood and Pittsburgh, they, they recognized that there were a lot of baby boomers. And so they built up their kiddie lands in the park to attract those children. And they would bring in TV personalities. Lone Ranger, Timmy, and Lassie as a featured guests to bring people into the park. But Rock Springs Park just seemed sort of frozen in time in the 1940s. All right, keep hitting the wrong button. Now this is uh, what a lot of people from my generation remember. This is the last turn of the cyclone along Carolina Avenue. And the pictures in the book are black and white, so when I could, I tried to colorize those for you to get a better picture of what it was like for us. So we would have seen this cyclone roller coaster just driving up and down Carolina Avenue, which is Chester's Main Street. And just past is what had been the original trolley turnaround, built at the turn of the last century. You can see the tracks are still there. Someone told me he was a trolley enthusiast. They had a key that would switch the track. And back in 1969, they put the key and the track still worked. And so they were still able to switch the track. Now this is the primary school where I went to school. This is Chester Primary School. And this picture was taken from the top of the cyclone a year after the park closed. The photographer Clarence Durbin climbed to the top of the cyclone. You can see how high up that was in the previous picture. and took this picture of the primary school. And I, I show you this picture because it was on the playground of the primary school. And there's a school from the opposite direction from East Liverpool looking over. There's the school and the park behind it. But it was on the playground of the primary school where I first heard rumors that they were going to tear down Rock Springs Park. 
And it was sort of like the old game of grapevine because it started out basically true. They're going to tear down Rock Springs Park and they're going to build a bridge that will go to East Liverpool, Ohio. But by the time it got to me, I heard they're going to tear down Raccoon Creek Park and they're going to build a bridge from there to East Liverpool. Now, if you're not familiar with Raccoon Creek Park, it's about 13 miles away from Chester. So as a kid, I'm imagining this 13 mile long bridge that connects Raccoon Creek Park to East Liverpool. Now, uh, our family um, had business in town, and I know a lot of business owners were concerned that this bridge was going to take away business because it would take away people driving through town the way they used to with the old bridge. Uh, so I understood totally because I'm like, it's not even skipping the town, it's skipping the entire state of West Virginia. <laughs> Well, the bridge did not cross over our school and create a shadow, which made me happy because I didn't want to live, you know, go to school under a bridge. You know, as a kid, I was like, hobos live under bridges, but they don't want that on our playground. But uh, it did not happen, but the bridge was constructed from the park. It passed pretty close to our school within a few hundred feet or yards. At this time, you can see it sort of stood in the waters of the Ohio River without a connection to either shore. In 1974, I was in fourth grade, and this was, uh, our school was just sort of the dark uh, silhouette behind the Cyclone's loading platform, the Cyclone roller coaster. So basically, this ghost park, which as a kid reminded me of, out of the scene from Scooby-Doo, uh, was right next to our school playground. We saw it every day, playing marbles by the fence, and there it was. So it's something that really stuck with me all these years, and I really had a lot of questions about. So it only took 30 years, but when I had kids of my own, I started researching the park, and uh, that's what led to the publication of the book. This is the uh, bumper cars. This would have been where they loaded up the bumper cars. So from the playground, we could see the carousel pavilion, and we're told by our mothers what a beautiful carousel was actually still locked inside there from the time the park closed in 1970 until the buildings and the rides were auctioned off in 1974. So this was the carousel that was boarded up inside the pavilion for those years. I'll tell you a little bit later about what happened to the carousel after the park closed. But I wrote in the book, I was only six years old when Rock Springs Park closed and the buildings were raised and the land leveled to make way for Route 30's approach to the Jennings Randolph Bridge. As a child, all I could ever do was stand on the edge of Rock Springs Park and look in. Unlike uh, some people from my generation who actually went to the park, as far as I know, what my parents tell me, I never even went to the park. So that left me with a lot of questions. Then uh, I came across this quote from author, author Tony Morrison, who said, If there's a book you really want to read and it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And I thought, you know, why not? Why not? So I didn't have any collections of pictures. I had some stories. I did some research online. But when I proposed the book, uh, I thought I knew quite a bit about the park. But as I really got into the research and getting pictures from people who knew and loved the park, I learned quite a bit more. So here we'll get started with the, the history. <clears throat> Native Americans of the Iroquois Kingdom originally used Rock Springs Park and its surrounding glade as a sacred hunting ground. And reputedly, George Washington drank from Rock Springs while camping near the entrance to the park. In 1770, George Washington and his friend and personal surveyor, William Crawford, embarked on a journey down the Ohio River from Pittsburgh for the purpose of viewing lands to be apportioned among soldiers who had served in the French and Indian War. And this is Washington's hand drawing of the three rivers. You can see the fort at Pittsburgh and then how the Ohio River actually travels north up and around the bend uh, of the northern panhandle. And you can actually see George Washington wrote Raccoon Creek. Now there are no records to prove where Washington spent that night, October 21st, 1770. Many of the early settlers claim it to uh, be on land which later became Rock Springs. But Washington was in the area on two separate occasions. And this newspaper clipping was uh, taken in 1932 Washington was born in 1732, so this was celebrating his 200th birthday. And they were reenacting his landing on Babs Island in the Ohio, which is just across from where the park once operated. And this is a postcard picture of Babs Island prior to any uh, 
dam uh, building. So the water level is quite a bit lower than it is today. You can see there's even a pond or small lake in the center of the island, which is no longer there. And this is the island as it looks today, and there's the off-ramp of the Jennings Randolph Bridge coming into East Liverpool. Just to give you an idea of the size, not quite to scale, but you can see the river did get quite, quite low in dry time. Now, Bob Hand, one of the owners, the last owner of the park, he claimed that it was a fact that Washington met with the Catawba Indians on what later became park land. He told a lot of people that. But it was probably based on this postcard, which shows an aerial view of the park. It was his father-in-law who was the previous owner. And on the postcard, it says that Washington uh, did party, uh, camp with his party on October 21st in 1770. So he was probably basing it on this advertisement for the park. And the park did use historical sites to attract visitors, uh, as well as the transit company did the same thing. Uh, the transit company uh, put out this ad. A great treaty was made between six powerful Indian nations. The council met at a large flat rock on the beach, confirming their peace agreement by carving tribal symbols on the rock face. Rock Springs Park owner C.A. Smith offered a 15-minute sightseeing tour to the stone drawings in 1910 and explained that they would soon be forever covered by the rising waters of the Ohio River, a direct result of the completion of Dam Number 8. So this is Indian Rocks, just one of a few postcards that you can find uh, of Indian Rocks. And uh, I believe I've only heard one story back in the 60s that the river level was low enough that you could see them a few inches below the water. But for the most part, they are now uh, buried under the waters of the Ohio River. In 1852, at least according to this map, there is no indication of Rock Springs Farm or Rock Springs Park. You can see East Liverpool, Ohio, developing on the other side of the river. By 1871, the spring and the farm are shown at the very bottom. You can see Rock Springs, Rock Spring, and then sort of off there, Rock Springs Farm. The site of the spring was first donated for picnics in 1857, and it was donated by the early farming families who felt its supply of refreshing spring water and wondrous scenic setting made it a perfect getaway spot for church outings and other civic affairs. Now this is the Broadway Wharf in East Liverpool today. And this is just a little closer. That's Chester across the way there. And it was from here that the Ollie Neville disembarked from the Broadway Wharf. I've kind of superimposed, you can see that. Uh, it was from this site that this ferry boat crossed the Ohio River and took pleasure seekers to the grove at Rock Springs. The Ollie Neville ended its run in, 18, in 1905, rather, and uh, it was then taken to uh, Ripley, New York, where it actually sank and is now listed among non diveable shipwrecks in Lake Erie. This early view of Rock Springs clearly illustrates the natural beauty of the park prior to any type of commercial development. And transportation to the park in the early years, other than by the ferry boat, was difficult. People would take buggies or wagons. Sometimes they could cross the river if it was low enough. So here you can see some weary travelers taking a drink from uh, the spring in the lower section of the park. And I did zoom in because the tree behind them has some carved initials, but I didn't see a GW for George Washington said, no evidence there. And here is a famous view of the spring down below. You can see they've added a pipe so uh, several people could get a drink. There's also a primitive water cooler off to the right with faucets. And above this, the spring are community cups on a shelf so people would just share the cups. I would imagine they were ceramic cups because of all the potteries nearby, but they could be tin cups. Well, this is perhaps the most famous picture postcard view. There's a couple of them. This is, is would be the his, and this is the hers. Again, you can see the community cups, kind of a better view there. This path through the early park led to the top of the hill. You can see a, a building there, which would have been a dining pavilion. But then big changes were underway. On May 27th, 1897, the first electric trolley of the Chester East Liverpool Street Railway Company crossed the New Chester Bridge and traveled to Rock Springs Park. The owner then was James J.E. McDonald. 
Here's a postcard picture where you can see a trolley traveling across the Chester Bridge towards Chester in the park. Today, uh, the Chester Bridge is gone and the southern portal is an overlook. So here's the southern portal, the postcard. And here's the overlook as it looked back in the 80s, as I remember it. And somebody has taken water to outline this spot in the pavement to show that this is where a toll booth once stood. Uh, the bridge became toll free in 1951. Today, the, the overlook has been dedicated to the memory of Dr. David S. Pugh, a family physician whose house and practice were just uh, half a block away from this site. Now, the trolley ran through my neighborhood and then went down Carolina Avenue. Now, I don't know if you noticed the difference here between this picture postcard view and an almost identical one here. Take it back. See the change? Yeah, the telephone pole, that's right. So, in the previous one, there were the telephone poles, and here there are no telephone poles. So, uh, a lot of times, postcard artists would romanticize images by removing undesirable features, telephone poles, junkyards, background clutter. I feel bad, the one guy was standing near the telephone pole, and he kind of got his backside removed. <laughs> Now the trolley originally ended at this station on Carolina Avenue. This would have been about the place where you saw the cyclone in an earlier picture along Carolina Avenue. People would get off the trolley, which is to the right, and ascend uh, this huge flight of stairs up to the dancing pavilion. This is the side view of the same pavilion and landscape looking northwest, so you're looking at the hills of East Liverpool. Um, this is the midway of J.E. McDonald's Park. Uh, in the center, there is a small building, and it says Tintype Gallery, so you can have Tintype photographs taken there. This is the first carousel pavilion in the park, not the one that we remember, but uh, a lot of people called it the L-shaped pavilion, just based on this one picture, but uh, a rare view from the other side shows you that it was actually L-shaped on the other side as well, so we have two L's, which make it more of a cross or a plus sign shape. And this was the first roller coaster in the park. This is a figure eight coaster. And actually, Kennywood Park, which uh, calls itself the roller coaster capital of the world, their first coaster was also a figure eight, but Rock Springs had theirs first. And as you can see from this picture, people wore their Sunday best to the park. Of course, they would have had few clothes at the time. There were clothes, and then there Sunday dress clothes. This is a walking bridge that was not there in later years that crossed the lower uh, path in the picnic section of the park. This one of a kind rotating fountain, I can only imagine at night with the conduit spray and the lights and the mirrors would have made quite a sight, quite a spectacular sight at night. So now we're going to move into the C.A. Smith year, starting in 1900. According to the history of Chester, the Gateway to the West by Roy C. Cash Dollar, a 170-acre tract that had, been bought, that had been bought by McDonald in 1890 was then purchased by C.A. Smith in 1900, with about 11 acres slated for use for Rock Springs Park. Now this is Charles C.A. Smith. He was a transit company owner, pottery manufacturer, oil operator, gentleman farmer, and owner at that time of Rock Springs Park. And he is well remembered by the citizens of Chester as a very colorful character, is how they describe him. In fact, Roy C. Cash Dollar in his history of Chester wrote, C.A. Smith put Chester on the map with that park. They tell how he drove his first car, the first automobile in town, a Stanley Steamer, across the river when the water was low. And how Mr. Smith was stopped by a state trooper on his way to New Cumberland one day, as he liked to travel fast for he was always in a hurry. He told the officer that day, go ahead and write two citations, as I will soon be coming back the other way, and I will be traveling just as fast. <laughs> so it pays to have money, apparently. Now Smith is pictured here at center with the employees of the transit company. So just to give you an idea, there he is, looking very stern. <clears throat> and here is one of the summer trolleys. 
during the warm weather months, many trolley companies operated these open trolleys, which were very popular, popular with the riding public. These became known as breezers to the people who rode them because they were open, as you can see, on all four sides, and provided a cooling breeze on a warm summer day. It was sort of the trolley company's way of providing air-conditioned service. Of course, these trolleys remind me, probably uh, most of you, of Mr. Rogers' trolley. And this is Idlewild Park, and that actually comes into play in the history of Rock Springs with the next owner, and I will be discussing that. But you can ride Mr. Rogers' trolley in Rock Springs, and, and of course he is from Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Now under Smith, the trolley that had stopped and let you up the huge flight of stairs was extended just another block, and they created this trolley turnaround, which was still there uh, when I was a kid. The first passenger trains began to arrive in 1901, and these excursion trains quickly tripled attendance at the park, sometimes reaching 15,000, 20,000 visitors in one day. So if you'll kindly listen to this selection, this is about a trip to the park from Coshocton, Ohio, in 1902. Rock Springs Park, the greatest excursion attraction ever given the people of Coshocton and vicinity will be given, Thursday, July 3rd, 1902. The people who have never visited the state of West Virginia will get a view of her most beautiful, almost mountainous scenery, almost mountainous. <laughs> you will go over that magnificent Ohio River Bridge, which will give you a view of all the scenes along the Ohio for many miles among the most picturesque in all the country. The river banks are literally lined with potteries, tile works, brickyards. Then to watch the boats flying up and down the river is worth the trip. Access to the largest pottery works in the world, over 40, will be given. On the picnic grounds, you will find a great hall, a free orchestra, the greatest roller coaster in the country, tables, dining halls, and free use of the stoves, gas heat for coffee making, merry-go-rounds, and other attractions. There is a splendid ball ground and grandstand. Spring water from rocks in abundance, dining halls, and restaurants of plenty. In fact, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been expended to beautify the place with buildings, flowers, trees, and walks. It is the greatest trip for the money. And then a little peer pressure. It seems everyone is going. By consent, business will be suspended. July 3rd will now be substituted for July 4th. See circulars and booklets. But this kind of gives you an idea of sort of grandiose language, but it gives you an idea of not only the spectacle of what the park was about, but the excursions just to get there, and the fact that towns, whole towns would close down for the day. Now, Coshocton is approximately midway between Canton and Columbus, Ohio, just about the center of the state, so a trip there would have been well over 100 miles at that time. So here is the train station in Chester. Excursionists would disembark and walk about two blocks along a cinder path to get to that lower trolley entrance. Area businesses and local school districts booked large group excursions. In fact, that was still how the park was able to operate in later years. They still had company picnics and school picnics. Whole towns were closed down for the day, as I said. This is a, an ad for, for the employees of Westinghouse Air Brake Company in Pittsburgh. Uh, this comic illustration was in their company picnic brochure. Today I live in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and this ad was found in the Greensburg Daily Tribune on July 30th, 1929, and it describes a train trip. You would take the train from Greensburg, then in Rochester, get on a steamship to go to the park, but we had talked earlier about the fact that you wouldn't have spent much time at the park. You'd only have a couple hours before you would have to go back. And here's another one of those comic illustrations. Obviously, they're lightening the load by sacrificing a passenger ensure a faster trip for the lucky crew remaining. Now, although blimps were not really taken to the park, there was a blimp that was a featured attraction there in 1910. Captain Jack Dallas piloted his aircraft Saturday afternoon at Rock, Spring, at Rock Springs Park uh, across the Ohio River to the Diamond in Liverpool, and he returned in a remarkably short space of time. The flight was witnessed by 15,000 visitors, many of whom came hundreds of miles just to enjoy the sight. If the reader has never seen the flight of an airship, it is the grandest sight imaginable. Don't fail to see it at Rock Springs Park this week. It may be your last opportunity. So if we think about today, we see planes flying all the time. Of course, after 9-11, it was eerie that there were no uh, 
trails in the sky, no jets flying, so that was different for us. But for them to see something, a manned uh, 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 aircraft floating, I mean, even today it would be amazing to see. Uh, but it was quite the event at the time. And just to give you an idea, this is a postcard from Ontario Beach Park in Rochester, New York, and it also shows Captain Jack Dallas sort of piloting his blimp into the field. Now, if you look at the Rock Springs Park ad for Captain Jack Dallas's exhibit, you will notice that it also features the famous chicken and waffle dinner for 50 cents. It's one of my favorite pictures of the park, just to give you an idea of all the visitors there. You can see chicken and waffles dinner advertised in the back as well. So it was People in their uh, dress clothes with parasols, that sort of reminds me of this George Seurat painting. Think about it, it would have been a little bit before that, but it's kind of a similar picture. And this postcard shows a similar view, but nothing tells a story like that photograph. Trains and trolleys, horses and buggies, and even blimps were used, but uh, this ad shows that some people came, just as the Native Americans had, in canoes. This describes a trip in canoes from uh, Beaver, Pennsylvania. And I don't know what I find more delightful about this, the fact that people took canoes to the park, or the fact that it was Beaver people traveling in canoes. So I can kind of imagine, you know, Billy from Family Circus reading that and imagining, you know, something like that. A creature from Narnia comes to the park. Somebody actually made that. <laughs> I don't have that in my position. Uh, you will see that a trip to the park would have been a nice downstream trip, but the return trip, uh, their canoes were shipped back by freight. So that, that would have been a neat uh, excursion. Of course, that was before any dams were constructed. Now, this is just inside the lower gate. The trolley turned around, seen through the arches there. And this would have been, for most people, the entrance into the park. Uh, the first site would have been the old mill. The old mill was one of the most popular attractions at Rock Springs Park. Uh, it was a dark ride that featured small boats winding through a long channel with historical scenes painted uh, on canvas backdrops. Now, it was there until 1915 when it was destroyed by a disastrous fire on June 5th. The fire claimed the lives of four school children who were visiting the park during an annual school picnic. And this was a newspaper account from the time. Without warning, the flames sprang out of the entrance to the old mill Saturday evening. A boy nearby ran to the park office, and the attendant sent in a fire call. The dynamo had stopped, and some of the boats were stalled in the various passages. The men in charge opened all the doors possible for exits and contents, and contents from three boats going through were discharged in that way, so they were able to pull some of the passengers out. Seven persons in the leading boats were so close to the entrance or to the exit that their boat shot through the flames, but not until after the flames had a good start, which accounts for the terrible burns on the four children in that first boat. While rescue work was going on, thousands of people crowded about the place. The company office was besieged with people desiring information and the use of the telephone. One Scores of women fainted and pandemonium reigned in the red glare of the flames, which quickly burst through the tightly constructed building. The first of the three children perished uh, on the scene. Uh, another child was able to hold on for a few weeks, but she succumbed to her injuries. And this ad, which is courtesy of the archives, was the ad uh, asking people to attend the park that day. You can see the school picnic of June 5th, 1915. And I heard one story told of uh, a trolley driver his daughter was in the park. He heard the news, had no idea if she was safe or not, and he did not stop for passengers. He flew straight to the park, stopped at where the old entrance used to be, raced up the hill and saw this scene uh, down over the other side in the valley there. And this is the aftermath just after the fire. The ride was not rebuilt. It was replaced instead by a fountain and flower garden and would be the only amusement ride ever to operate in the lower picnic section of the park. Now there were some other features in the lower park as you passed 
the old mill across the main promenade. He would, he would come to the large boulders that surrounded the spring. Dining pavilions, picnic pavilions in the lower park. Beyond that was the summer theater. And uh, this is a postcard view of the interior of the summer theater. Here, vaudeville shows were performed daily and in the evenings, as well as silent movies were shown. Here's a postcard featuring one of the vaudeville acts, the two admirals. Variety magazine reported that singer Sophie Tucker appeared at Rock Springs Park in 1908, and she made quite an impression on the townspeople of Chester that summer in her tour de force stage performance. Tucker crooned in blackface at the assistance of her manager, Phil Hathaway, and others who claimed that she was, quote, too fat and ugly, unquote, to be accepted by an audience in any other context. Although some fans flocked to the Park Summer Theater to see her, it was an impromptu performance on the street of Chester which led to a major controversy. Sophie was spotted in town wearing a new sheath dress, and she happily demonstrated to an admiring crowd how easily she could step from the curb and avoid puddles while wearing it. When local law enforcement, enforcement threatened to jail her for exposing not only her ankle, but a flash of leg during the exhibition, she was briskly escorted to the local news agency by newsmen and interviewed about the event. Now Tucker, as many of you probably know, continued to perform into the mid-60s, and she was known as the last of the Red Hot Mamas for her body, song, style, and lyrics. And perhaps her size, or more likely the volume at which she sang, led Paul McCartney to jokingly refer to her as the Beatles' favorite American group. <laughs> Beyond the summer theater, there was a bathhouse, and the swimming pool to the right is just under construction here in 1904. Next to the bathhouse, Guests would step from the veranda to the viewing platform to watch swimmers frolic in the water below. Not everyone knew how to swim, so you could still get wet. Uh, this end of the pool uh, was shallow, like walking into the waters at the beach, and uh, went up to 12 feet at the other end where the diving platform is. Next to the, well, you can see that they wore wool bathing suits, which would have made it a little more difficult to swim, adding that weight once the wool was wet. And they actually rented swimsuits and towels, and they had a laundry room in the basement of the bathhouse. Next to the swimming pool, you can see the wall of the pool there. This was the lake, a man-made lake constructed by C.A. Smith. And I had some other images of this lake, and I was dying to know what that sign said on the island. And uh, I found an image that was large enough that I could zoom in, and the sign reads, all boats must keep to the right. <laughs> that was it. I was like, oh. Makes sense though. Now, peace and serenity could be found in the lower picnic section of the park. Those uh, seeking the noise and excitement of amusements would have traveled to the upper park, shown here in 1911. Left and right are the baseball diamond. We see it's all kind of crowded in there. The world's greatest scenic railroad, the casino, the, I'm sorry, the shoot the shoots pool there in the center, the casino dance pavilion, which was a new pavilion. And the figure eight coaster is still there, although they had updated it and it was called Leap the Dips. Now this picture postcard kind of shows what was happening at the turn of the last century. You have all the entertainment here in the foreground, but if you look in the background to the left is a tin mill. That's where the primary school was built uh, with its black smoke coming from the smokestacks. And to the right is the pottery, which would have been Taylor Smith and Taylor pottery, which is still there until just recently they raised that building. The baseball diamond at Rock Springs Park was added in 1900 and hosted many famous athletes from Ohio and the Pennsylvania Baseball League. The posters displayed on this storefront read, Patriotic Day, Rock Springs Park, come spend the day. Baseball game, 2.30. East Liverpool Pirates versus Steubenville. All amusements will be in operation. And this is sort of an unnerving twist on the pony ride, I guess. <laughs> Here, children ride a bull, restrained only by a nose ring and a slight section of chain link. Um, and I'm not sure the saying, Rock Springs, we have our 
blank. Is that a bowl where you're supposed to fill in the blank? But owner C.A. Smith actually began uh, raising prized Hereford cattle on his Hillcrest farm, uh, and he won many competitions. In fact, just a few years before he passed away, his main breeding bull, H.C. Larry Domino the Twelfth, was sold for $105,000 in 1951. So that was quite a bit of money for an animal. In 1906, alongside the baseball stadium, Smith built the world's greatest scenic railway, a gravity-operated train which ran for a mile-long descent through the forest of the park. Cars were pow powered up spiral tracks inside the scenic railway station. In this vintage photograph, you can see that the hand cars were adorned with carved dragon heads connected by a handbar. And in the back, uh, that is actually a brakeman standing up back there. It would have controlled the speed of the car throughout the length of the trip. Now, this was basically a pretty tame pleasure ride throughout the park, but there aren't lights, so I'm guessing riding at night with the lights on would have added some thrill. And this is the shoot the shoots pool. Um, this was a feature in many Luna parks. Charleston had a Luna park at one time, and this was the central feature for a lot of those park designs. And this was a water thrill ride. You would ride in a flat bottom boat, starting at the top of a 50-foot flume, traveling to the man-made lagoon in seven seconds, and Rock Springs circulated 12 boats in a continuous run. Now at the bottom of the ramp, uh, there was a curved feature which made the boat sort of skip on the water when you hit the bottom, uh, a design inspired by inventor Captain Paul Boynton, who was watching boys skipping stones on a lake, and uh, added that feature to this ride. <coughs> And uh, at the top, boatmen in sailor suits and ride operators pose here with their wooden craft. So the boats would have been placed on a turntable and loaded up and sent down for the next ride. Now this is the bridge that spanned the chute's pool. And you can see a wedding was hosted in 1908. And this is not the only picture of weddings that I've seen. So this was you know, something we think of today. People get married in a hot air balloon or they get married on a roller coaster or something. But here we are. 1908 for people getting married in an amusement park. Now the golden age of the carousel paralleled that of these trolley companies. Rock Springs Park was no exception. In 1906, C.A. Smith contracted the Finley Brothers Company to build an octagonal carousel pavilion to house a recently purchased carousel manufactured in Coney Island. So this is not the carousel that I showed you in later years. Um, this was the second carousel in the park. Now this building, as I mentioned, was still there. This is a picture of it in 1970. And it was actually the last structure standing when the rest of the buildings were raised. Well, this is the image that I used for the cover of the book. And again, this is the casino dance hall, which would have been at the foot of the chute's reflecting pool. And uh, it was built in 1906 and replaced the original dancing pavilion from J.E. McDonald's Park. The first floor included Japanese tea gardens, six bowling alleys, a billiard hall, shooting gallery, barber shop, bathrooms, and park offices. The second floor was devoted entirely to dancing. There was an 18,000 square foot dance floor so that 750 couples could dance to the latest music. Now we move on uh, to the next era. The next owners were Charles Clinton C.C. McDonald and his wife Grace. They left an indelible mark on Rock Springs and the landscape of che Chester. They became uh, lessees of the park in 1926, coming from Summit Beach Park in Akron, Ohio. So some of the features that they added were the Denzel Carousel, Virginia Gardens Ballroom, Green Lantern Restaurant, and the Rustic Log House, which many of you are familiar with or would have seen in the earlier slides. So this is showing the upper part with Virginia Gardens Ballroom. You can see the cyclone on the left. Now many people remember the dance hall for dancing, but uh, I interviewed R.C. McDonald, who was the son of C.C. McDonald, 
and he's in his 90s, and he remembered the dance hall as a roller skating rink. And he told me, I, it was a happy place for me. I considered myself to be very proficient on skates and the two-step and the waltz. So unlike the days uh, when we used to go to the roller skating rink and just see how fast you could go in a circle, uh, the people were dancing, it was an art. This is the DeMar, I'm sorry, there's the roller skating. And this is the DeMar Miller Orchestra. Uh, many famous orchestras played at the park, uh, but this is a rare interior view, which was sent to me by a friend, Jerry Linger, from Chester. And the photograph is unique, as I said, because you get to see inside a building. But uh, I like the fact that uh, you can see the striped suits of the performers, of the six-piece orchestra, the lattice work, decorations, the keystone and the Art Deco band show and Jerry's favorite, which are the ornate lamps. Now this is another interior view, but this is taken in the 50s. This is Chester's Jubilee Court, the 50th anniversary of Chester in 1957. And my mother is actually pictured here. On, she is second from the left. And when I was talking about uh, the park to my students, they pointed out something that I never noticed. They said, oh yeah, she's the one who doesn't have a sleeveless gown on. So I was like, oh yeah, I never noticed that. Uh, here is an aerial view of the park, taken during the McDonald years. Uh, the small L-shaped building to the right is the high school before uh, some additions were made, the gym and some more classrooms. And to kind of point out here, that all those little black dots everywhere are cars. And that was something that really began to change the park. They never really had a parking lot for the park. People parked next to the school, they parked in the trolley turnaround. Here's a picture in 1969. You can see people are just parking in the trolley turnaround. You can see the tracks and uh, the bricks. Uh, the gentleman who shared a lot of these pictures with me said, when I stumbled on the park, I was delighted to find that lower entrance because to me, uh, it was sort of like a yellow brick road leading into a wonderland. The bricks were yellow, of course. This is one of those steamships. This is in Pittsburgh on the Mon Wharf. And this is the Homer Smith, the ship named for the captain. And uh, the Homer Smith made daily excursions. This is in the 1920s. And the sign, you can see to the right, almost Merrill's Orchestra plays nightly. So you could dance and listen to music on your way to the park as well as once you arrive there. Now, as you can tell, I love to talk about Rock Springs Park, and I can kind of bring it up almost in any conversation, yeah. my wife tells me. And uh, I teach elementary school. One day uh, I was picking up one of my students from first grade, and uh, she was saying, uh, this girl is constantly tipping her chair, and I don't know what to do about it. I'm worried about her safety. I'm worried about the safety of the students around her. She was like, I don't know what to do. How long have people been tipping their chairs anyway? So I thought about this picture in the book. If you zoom in here on the top deck, there's a boy <laughs> tipping his chair. So I responded to her question, uh, I know for a fact that kids have been tipping their chairs since 1928, at least that far back. I don't think she appreciated my observation. <laughs> now the sign on the Ferris wheel says, C3 States. Once at the top, rocking couples could catch a stunning glimpse of West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, as well as the beautiful Ohio River. Ticket booths like the one shown here in this postcard picture were found throughout the park, including in those later years. A lot of people today who are used to park passes or paying as you enter are surprised to know that you can wander through the park. Uh, if you go in and take a seat on the bench of the carousel, you just couldn't take a ride unless you bought some park tickets. And uh, again, the idyllic postcard here versus more of a photographic postcard here. Uh, but the same rides, there's an airplane ride, the cyclone, and there's a joy ride back there, the octopus. Now, it is no great coincidence that the same year Rock Springs Park saw record attendance was the year the popular cyclone roller coaster was introduced. The cyclone was a basic out and back style coaster designed by Harry C. Baker, who also designed Coney Island's cyclone. Now, Rock Springs Park cyclone closed. Uh, in 1970, uh, 
but Coney Island's cyclone, of a different design, but the same name, still operates as it has been designated as a uh, historic monument. Now, Baker used the features of Chester, starting next to the school and dropping into a ravine behind Virginia Gardens before shooting you out in the final turn high above Carolina Avenue. Not only were the tracks high, but they were up, as you saw in those steps that people were climbing from the trolley, up on a hill. So it really felt like you were way up there on this final turn. And here again is the log house. McDonald used to take hunting trips to Canada, and he had uh, contain, uh, Canadian carpenters come down and build this log house for him with logs from Canada. In 1931, just five years after being named lessee, McDonald became interested in Idlewild Park in Ligonier. The McDonald's and their two sons, Richard and Jack, pulled up stakes and moved to Ligonier. In 1935, newlyweds Robert L. Hand and Virginia McDonald Hand, so she's the daughter of the previous owners, became the sixth and last managers of Rock Springs Park. Ironically, during the park's last few years, most of the patrons came from outside the area, many from Pittsburgh, who sought to relive their youth in a park that seemed frozen in time, where Rock Springs still had the airplanes on the airplane ride. Many parks have replaced those with silver rockets. Here in 1938, Virginia and Bob Hand are seen between the park office and the Virginia Gardens in the background is that final turn of the cyclone. Although some carnival type rides were added, the basic layout of the park changed very little for the 35 years that the hands managed and owned the park. Here the 12 car whip provided thrills at 10 cents a ride. The airplane ride swings out over the whip in the ticket booth. This is about 1940. There were some features added for baby boomers, but this is actually in the 40s. This was a kitty train that was there for a while. Now both Richard R.C. McDonald, who spoke of roller skating in the park, and his brother-in-law, Robert L. Hand, present owner at this time, served in the armed forces during World War II. McDonald, who had a lifelong interest in aviation, was 20 years old, pictured here, when he joined the Air Force. While Mr. Hand, was drafted and spent several months in the Army until they found that he had been too old actually to qualify for the draft. Rock Springs Park, like a lot of parks, remained closed during the war, and it wasn't until her husband returned from the war that they reopened the park in the winter of 1946. So Virginia Hand was in Ligonier with her parents at that time. So not to be outdone, here is Robert Hand with his own a uh, station wagon, or a woody, that he called them sometimes, with rock springs on the door. The little building behind him was the office, and believe it or not, in that tiny space up there, Tish Hand, who would be his uh, daughter-in-law, and his son uh, lived in that apartment for a summer with their first son, Robert C. Hand. And she told me uh, in an email that she lived in this office, and the roller coaster's north curve was just 10 feet away, you can see the office there, from the window and went roaring by on the weekends. Can you imagine how many times? I'm trying to keep a baby having a nap. Now this is backing up a little bit because here's her husband as a child. And uh, it, like I said, it's very unusual to have a family who lives in an amusement park while it's operating. But he was able, and this is taken in wintertime, to ride his tricycle about the park. And I know that, um, oh, I lost my place there. I know this is a Colson 1940s era chain-driven tricycle, tricycle, and I know that because I sent this picture to a website called tricyclefetish.com. <laughs> They're all about tricycles. And you will see my question and the answer given. But if you notice, the next questioner asks, what kind of tricycle does Henry Louis Gates Jr. ride? I don't know if you know, West Virginia biographer uh, likes to ride his tricycle, which he calls the Soul Mobile. So they actually couldn't answer it. They think it might be, uh, might have been made specifically for him. So if you have a tricycle, you're wondering about tricycle fetish. Now the hands uh, in later years would winter in Florida, but when the kids were younger, 
they would stay in the log house, and here you can see it decorated for Christmas. Uh, Richard Kay, who has passed on, his wife Tishan told me that uh, he told her when he was a kid he would jump from the balcony onto this chandelier and swing from it like a swashbuckler in the motion pictures. And here's the Han family in the log house. And again, the Carousel Pavilion in 1970, park's last season, and the dental uh, carousel that was inside. Now the inventor of the Ferris wheel was actually from Pittsburgh, Gail Ferris, George Washington Gail Ferris, and he founded his company in Pittsburgh, but Rock Springs Park uh, Ferris wheel was a big Eli, which debuted in uh, 1900. Uh, Rock Springs Park got theirs much later. Uh, but they were mass produced by a bridge company. This is the arcade. In later years, you can see they haven't added any paint. So uh, Tishan told me that uh, her father-in-law knew the park was going to be removed uh, quite a bit before most people in town knew of it. So there was no reason to paint the structures or try to maintain upkeep. But this is the arcade as it looked uh, during the McDonald years in the 20s. In October of 1970, Bob Hand passed away from complications following a heart attack. The park had closed that Labor Day and would never reopen. However, one last fling for old time's sake was held in June 1974 at the park. Hundreds of people returned for this farewell dance to close the evening, and the band played Old Lang Syne at 1.10 a.m. to make it officially the last dance at Virginia Gardens. At this time, an auction was held in which park buildings, rides, and hundreds of other items were sold to the highest bidder. The Smithsonian came to inspect the carousel for possible purchase for use on the mall in Washington, D.C. In fact, a lot of people thought that's where it ended up. However, uh, the Smithsonian chose not to buy it. They were looking for a menagerie carousel that had not just horses, but other animals. And they also cited the carousel's plain rounding board. A lot of the carousels have carved figure heads, and Rock Springs look more like a wedding cake, just sort of flout. So the fate of the famed carousel became a mystery. Uh, some people thought it was bought by Disney and reassembled at a Disney park. In 1985, Susan Weaver, a librarian back home, wrote an article in the East Liverpool Review which updated readers on the whereabouts. In 1985, she wrote, The present owner is the Friels Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization for the preservation of carousels. The foundation president, Larry Fields, has stated that this particular Denzel model is one of the finest carousels in the nation. The foundation is located in San Francisco and plans call for the establishment of a museum there, where the carousel of Rock Springs Park will be exhibited. Now at the time of the story, the machine was still stored, this is 1985, 10 years it's still stored in the crates that they boxed it up in back in 1974. Unfortunately, the, the carousel was never reassembled at the museum, and the nonprofit closed in 1998, and many of their Rides and horses were auctioned off. Rock Springs Denso horses were auctioned off individually, uh, getting prices of $16,000 just for one horse. <coughs> they have casts and uh, replicas of horses from another carousel in California that they would uh, attach to the carousel. And according to eBay, where the cyclone or the uh, the carousel appeared on eBay just for a very brief time, but I noticed that they were offering it for $650,000. Now for my generation, as I mentioned before, this is how we remember the park, that ghost park. The carousel pavilion is just beyond the lunch stand on the left. Here, workers contemplate trying to save the band show. Uh, they were trying to transport it down to the city park. It made it there, but it didn't last long. It fell apart soon after. Now these are the stone or the uh, cement supports 
for what had been the shoot the shoots ride. They were still waiting <coughs> on the last day. And this is actually Scott Paulson, uh, who um, was a resident of Chester, but later became known for doing the morning show in Pittsburgh's WDVE, and now he writes columns uh, for the trip. Here's Virginia Gardens Dance Hall. It is uh, shown here with some of the kiddie rides resting in front. And a close-up view shows us the number four painted on the building. This indicates the order of demolition of the remaining structures in the park. But even as of the time of the last dance, the Panhandle Press reported, Sunday night was the last dance at Virginia Gardens, unless we were fortunate to have a local buyer of the building for community use. So even at that time, they thought, perhaps like the log house, they could save it and move it. Uh, unfortunately, it was purchased for the lumber, especially the large beams underneath, which supported the floor for roller skating. With its troughs and extension pipes gone, the area near the spring returned to the look it may have had when George Washington visited with a survey party. For many local residents, uh, the loss of the spring in the wood grove was more devastating than losing the amusement park itself. Here, the Ohio Valley's most beautiful ballroom is just hours away from becoming a memory. Even as the last remains of the park were coming down, the main truss of the Jennings Randolph Bridge could be seen in the background. Again, it wasn't connected to either shore at this time. Well, it's a little difficult to see in this image, but here you're looking toward the high school from um, the area near where C.A. Smith's house is today, but you're looking past the lower part across the midway toward the high school. But you can see that the park and the separation between the upper park and the lower park is nearly non-existent, and some of those uh, boulders which would have been uh, formed after millions of years lie shattered in a pile of rubble. And here they are cutting the mountain in two. This is beyond where the lake was. They have drained the lake. And people who enter that pass today, uh, many of them have no idea what was there uh, under their tires as they roll along uh, through West Virginia to Ohio. Now the park is gone, but many folks back home have tried to keep the memory alive. There is the historic marker. Many articles written about the park. Uh, this article by Susan Weaver. Photographers who documented the park in its heyday and its final days. And collectors like Dr. James Smith. He was from East Liverpool, and he was very interested from his childhood trips to the park during the Depression. Uh, he really liked the carousel, but he loved the arcade games of chance. His father didn't like him wasting his money on those, but when he became a doctor in New York, living in Connecticut, his wife happened to just buy him uh, a game, an iron cast game, and that sort of clicked with him his childhood, and he became a collector of all of these uh, different uh, park arcade games and lots of other park memorabilia. Now, uh, he did donate the Wurlitzer Band organ from the park. He was able to purchase that and not, not the carousel. But he donated that um, in the early 90s, 1994. Um, and now you can see it at the Lou Holtz Upper uh, Ohio Valley Hall of Fame Museum. It's in the window there. You can drop a quarter in and listen to it play. Bill Gray is another collector from the area. And uh, he has lots and lots of dishes and souvenir glasses from the park, and also many postcards. And this is a memorial park that was built on a corner section of where the park used to stand, and it's maintained by the Lions Club today. And across the street from the memorial park is Rock Springs Parks. So, kind of a fun way to keep the memory alive. And uh, many collectors have bought items on eBay, or bought them, in this case, at the time of the auction, and restored them. <coughs> There's now a memory lane room, which talks about the history of Chester, but also the park, which is in the old high school building. Uh, that's the Chester Hall of Fame, 
And the showcases uh, behind glass there, that's where lockers used to be when uh, we went to school. And I don't remember being pushed inside one of those lockers, but yeah. it's possible. Iris Sayre did what I'm doing today. He showed slideshows and told stories of the park. And Richard Boker uh, became a good friend. I stumbled upon him through uh, ACE, which is the American Coaster Enthusiast Group. And I found out that he had seven or eight photo albums of the park. Uh, I wanted to call him up right away, but they said you'll have to write him a letter, which I did. And I got a very nice letter in response, typed on a typewriter with an old typing paper. And he said, you may come over and scan as many pictures as you like. So even after the book came out, we had many uh, lunches together, try to meet with him once a month, especially in the summer. And uh, he just passed away last summer. So I want to thank Mr. Boker for all he did. And I have one last story, and that is because, as was mentioned in the introduction, I live in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And this is a bit of news, actually for people in Chester as well, because this is a, a, a fact that I unburied, uh, discovered while researching Latrobe. And Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and Chester have a connection. And it is the world's largest teapot. Now the history of the teapot states um, that it was constructed by William Babe de Bon. Um, it started out as a gigantic root beer barrel uh, and was used for an advertising campaign for Hire's Root Beer. Now de Bon purchased the barrel in Pennsylvania, that's all we know, and he had it shipped to Chester where it was set up on Carolina Avenue. It was actually moved from its original location here to near the on-ramp to the bridge. Now what I discovered, and no one knows as far as I know back home, is that a guy from Latrobe first had that root beer barrel in his front yard. Now at the time, miniature golf was a big craze. So much to the dismay of his wife, I imagine, he ripped out all the landscaping in his front yard and built an 18-hole miniature golf course in the 20s. Um, he bought the root beer barrel and used it as a clubhouse for the, for the uh, miniature golf course. You would go in there, get your club, your card, and he sold root beer that he made because he was a pharmacist from Latrobe, as well as a Renaissance man, apparently. And uh, he's also famous in Latrobe and beyond because he is the pharmacist who invented the banana split. So he's kind of a big deal. They're having a, a, a big party this summer when they erect, finally erect a historical marker for the banana split. Now there's a couple of other cities that uh, think that they were first, but according to uh, the articles that I've read, La Trobe has better documentation. So good thing to keep all those documents like they do here in the archives. So I'd like to thank the archives. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I appreciate you uh, sitting through the life story of the park from the very beginning the final days. But thank you, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments right now.
Yes. It's up to the top and go, ah, you know, you know, always hear right. that. So we're, the whole day long, we would hear, ah, and then they would go, over and over and over again. Even from the upper end, you could hear. Yeah. You can imagine. Yeah. Now, Dr. Mike West, who gave me a couple of photographs from the book, he lived a few doors down mm -hmm. from the chain lift. So he remembers on summer nights, nobody had air conditioning. You had to yeah. lie in bed next to the screen, hoping mm -hmm. for a breeze. But he could hear people screaming as they went up the chain lift. So you heard the other end. They run everyone around the bed. Yeah. Now, I, I, I like roller coasters. I'm okay with coasters. I'm even okay with merry-go-rounds, but I can't, I can't ride spinning rides. But even roller coasters anymore. But I definitely never let go. <laughs> I'm amazed that people do. There's one picture in the book of a guy who's in the front car, and maybe he's a worker. He's kind of sitting sideways and he's looking back at everybody, coming out of that final turn. Right? So apparently it wasn't uh, a scare or a thrill for him. Yeah, anybody else who remembers the park? Have any memories or questions? My dad lived right down the street from there on Indiana Avenue. Yeah, so it's kind of fun to go on some of these sites and hear people's memories. I actually started a blog uh, before the book came out, and that's how Cassie Hand found me. And she was one of the reasons, another one of the reasons that I wrote the book. She was, she was like, how do you know so much about this park? I said, I grew up there. I've just been fascinated by it. She said, you should write a book about it. And um, then um, after the book came out, I kind of took down a lot of the stuff I had up because I found that not all of it was accurate. Um, <laughs> So I started it up again, and I haven't really gone back there since December, but if you go on the blog, if you're interested in any facts about the park, you just type it in the search, and you'll probably find an article or two, or a link or two, to answer your question. So are there any other questions or memories? Well, thank you again. I appreciate you coming, and uh, it's just been a delight for me to be here. I've never been to Charleston, believe it or not. It's a beautiful city. Just seeing that golden dome as I drove up. And I've watched a lot of these talks on YouTube. So uh, I hope this one will be up. And uh, Bob Barnett's here. And uh, we can have a little battle maybe with how many hits you get versus how many I But uh, you guys are like celebrities to me, Bob, because uh, I've watched you on, on YouTube several times. And uh, this is almost like a television set here. I've seen these books several times as well. So, uh, thank you again. Thank you very much.